Thank you very much. I always have to start by saying I'm not an astrologer. Um, a few years ago, I met a well-known Indian tycoon. Knowing I had the title Astronomer Royal, he asked, do you give this queen her horoscopes? <laughs> and I responded with a straight face, if she wanted one, I'm the person she'd ask. And he then seemed eager to hear my predictions. I told him that equities would fluctuate, there'd be tensions in the Middle East, and other sort of insights. And he paid great attention. But then I came clean. I said, I'm just an astronomer, not an astrologer. He then lost all interest in my predictions. <laughs> and rightly so, because scientists are rotten forecasters, almost as bad as economists. Twelve years ago, um, undeterred, I wrote a book which I entitled Our Final Century? Question mark. My publisher cut out the question mark, and the American publisher then changed the title to Our Final Hour. <laughs> yeah, Americans like instant gratification and the reverse. <laughs> well, I didn't think that we'd wipe ourselves out, but I was worried that we'd have a bumpy ride through the century. Science is ever more empowering, but it's running ahead faster than society can, co can cope with it. New technologies, bio, cyber, and AI, offer great hopes, but they'll expose us to new vulnerabilities. Some of these concerns are here already. The labor market disruption from robotics, new bioethical dilemmas, cyber threats, and environmental pressures. But I want to look ahead further. I do this with great diffidence because, for instance, the transformation brought about by smartphones and the internet could hardly have been predicted even 20 years ago. So if I want to look before, forward to 2050 and beyond, we must keep our minds open or at least ajar to what may now seem utter science fiction. On the bio front, the great physicist Freeman Dyson conjectures a time when children will be able to create new organisms or viruses just as routinely as his generation played with chemistry sets. I suspect this is way beyond the science fiction fringe, but were even part of this scenario to come about, our ecology and even our species would not survive long unscathed. But what about another transformative technology? Robotics and machine intelligence. It's advancing fast, and currently prominent in popular culture and movies. Computers don't learn as we do. They use brute force methods. They learn to identify dogs, cats, and human faces by crunching millions of images, not the way a baby learns. They learn to translate from foreign languages by reading multilingual versions of millions of pages of, for instance, EU documents. They never get bored. <laughs> there have been exciting advances in what's called generalized machine learning. DeepMind, a small London company that Google recently bought for a nine-figure sum, has created a machine that can figure out the rules of all the old Atari computer games without being told, and then play them better than any human. And that's a portent of what's coming. Advances in sensors and motor skills, though, have been slower. Robots can beat a world champion at chess, but they're still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. They can't tie your shoelaces or cut your toenails. But robots are advancing apace. And within a decade or two, they'll have transformed most kinds of work. Not just manual, but clerical, routine legal, medical, diagnosis, and surgery. But how long will it take before machines achieve general purpose human-level intelligence? There's a range of views among the experts. Some say only 30 years, others say never. The median guess in a recent survey was about 50 years. And some then seriously fear what would happen if a machine developed a mind of its own? Would it stay docile, a sort of idiot savant, or would it go rogue? If it could infiltrate the internet, 
and the Internet of Things, it could manipulate the rest of the world. And it may have goals utterly orthogonal to human wishes, or even treat humans as an encumbrance. Well, this is decades away at the very least, but many experts think the field of AI already needs guidelines, just as biotech clearly does. And there's disagreement, incidentally, about the likely design of human-level AI. Some think we should emulate nature and reverse engineer the human brain. Others say that is misguided as designing flying machines by copying how birds flap their wings. And philosophers debate whether consciousness is special to the wet organic brains of humans, apes and dogs, so that robots, even if their intellect seems superhuman, may still lack self-awareness or inner life. That's a serious debate. Once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones. And that would be a real intelligence explosion. Or we have to ask whether humans could transcend biology by merging with computers, extreme cyborgs, maybe losing their individuality and evolving into a common consciousness. In old-style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. The most prominent and over-the-top advocate for runaway machine intelligence, what's sometimes called a singularity, is someone called Ray Kurzweil, who now works at Google. He thinks it could happen within 25 years. But he's in his 60s already, and he's worried he may not live that long. So he takes dozens of pills each day, and if he dies, he wants his body frozen until this nirvana is reached, and he could be revived or his brain downloaded. I was once interviewed by a group of these cryonic enthusiasts in California. Where else? It was called the Society for the Abolition of Involuntary Death. <laughs> these people will freeze your body so that when immortality is on offer, you can be resurrected. I told them I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than a Californian refrigerator. <laughs> and they derided me as an old-fashioned deathist. <laughs> but I was surprised to find, recently incidentally, that three academics I know were cryonic enthusiasts. Two had paid the full whack, and the third had taken the cut price option of just having his head frozen. <laughs> I'm glad to say these were from Oxford and not from Cambridge. <laughs> a huge extension in lifespan would, of course, have drastic social consequences, um, and we must be aware that that may happen. In regard to all these speculations, we don't know where the boundary lies between what may happen and what will remain science fiction. But the direction of travel is predictable even if the rate of travel isn't. One context where robots surely have a future is in space. We've had this year images beam back from Pluto and from a comet. Pluto's 10,000 times further away than the moon. It's a great achievement. And in coming decades, the whole solar system will be explored by flotillas of miniaturized robots. And robotic fabricators may one day build vast lightweight structures floating in space. Solar energy collectors, gossamer thin radio telescopes, mining raw materials from the moon or asteroids, and deflecting any asteroid that may head our way. These robotic advances, incidentally, will erode the practical case for human spaceflight. Nonetheless, I hope people will follow the robots, though it'll be as risk-seeking adventurers rather than for practical goals. The most promising developments on this front are spearheaded by private companies. For instance, a company called SpaceX, led by Elon Musk, who also makes Tesla electric cars, has launched unmanned payloads and docked with a space station. He hopes soon to offer orbital flights to paying customers. And wealthy adventurers are even signing up for a week-long trip round the far side of the moon getting further from Earth than anyone's been before, 
but not actually landing on the moon. I've t I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight. <laughs> that may say something. <laughs> These private enterprise efforts, though, could tolerate higher risks than a Western government could impose on publicly funded civilians, and thereby cut costs. But they should be promoted as adventure or extreme sports. The phrase space tourism should be avoided because it lulls people into unrealistic confidence. But by 2100, groups of pioneers, courageous risk takers in the mold of Saranov Fines and people like that, may have established bases independent from the Earth, on Mars or maybe on asteroids. Musk himself says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> and he's 44 years old, so 40 years from now he might make it. And whatever, whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish these adventurers good luck in using all the resources of genetics and cyborg techniques to adapt themselves and their progeny to an alien environment. And this might lead, within only a few centuries, to divergence into a new species, the beginning of the post-human era. And here I must inject an astronomer's perspective on timescales, especially the far future. The stupendous timescales of the evolutionary past are now part of common culture, unless you live in Kentucky or parts of the Muslim world. But most people, happy with the idea that Darwinian evolution has taken four billion years to produce us, somehow think that we humans are the culmination of the evolutionary tree. No astronomer could believe that, because we know that our sun for formed four and a half billion years ago, but it's got six billion years more before its fuel runs out. And the expanding universe will go on perhaps forever. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. So post-human evolution, here on Earth and far beyond, could be as prolonged as the Darwinian evolution that's led to us. And the future lies with the machines, evolving by design and not by the slow and natural selection. There are incidentally chemical and metabolic limits to the size and processing power of wet organic brains. And maybe humans are close to those limits already. But there are no such constraints on computers. For these, the potential for further development could be as dramatic as the evolution from single-celled organisms to humans. So by any definition of thinking, the amount and intensity that's done by human-type brains will, in the far future, be utterly swamped by the cerebrations of AI. Moreover, the Earth's biosphere, in which organic life has symbiotically evolved, is far from optimal for the machines. The zero gravity of interplanetary space will be the preferred arena where robotic fabricators will have the grandest scope for construction and where non-biological brains may develop insights as far beyond our imaginings as string theory is for a mouse. But for all that, we humans shouldn't feel too humbled. Even though we're surely not the terminal branch of an evolutionary tree, we could be of special cosmic significance for jump-starting the transition to silicon-based and potentially immortal entities spreading their influence far beyond the Earth and transcending our limitations. Finally, let me zoom back in towards the present. Even in this concertina timeline, extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, this century is special. As my old book emphasized, it's the first where one species, ours, has Earth's future in its hands and could jeopardize life's immense potential. The events of the geological era called the Anthropocene. And all this future will be foreclosed if we and our children don't make it through the next decades. Spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support systems vulnerable to disruption and breakdown. But there's too little planning too little horizon scanning to minimize long-term risks. Our thinking is still too short-term. 
environmental degradation, extreme climate change, or unintended consequences of bio, cyber, and AI technology could trigger serious, even catastrophic setbacks. We must do all we can to avoid those, because this pale blue dot in the cosmos is a special place. It may be a unique place, and we're its stewards at a specially crucial era. And that's a message for all of us, whether we are interested in astronomy or not. Thank you very much.